Hello everyone, welcome to Electronics Prepper, the channel where we try to learn as much as possible about electronics to become more self-reliant with technology and prepare for the future. In an electronics lab, even if just in a hobby electronics lab, we can never have too many devices, uh, too many apparatuses or too many of anything really. <laughs> um, this passion that we have seems to need uh, an ever-increasing number of uh, tools and devices and, uh, you know, measurement uh, uh, devices, all sorts of things. So, this quickly becomes a problem from a financial point of view. However, um, since, you know, we're learning how to build stuff, Many times it happens that we can actually build our own stuff that is way, way cheaper than the more or less equivalent commercially available product. Now, this uh, about uh, such a device is what I'm uh, what I would like to speak in this video and to present it to you. Um, at some point in time, when we get to a certain level in electronics, we might um, uh, we might be faced with the need to have one or more differential probes for uh, our oscilloscopes. Simply because, due to one reason or another, we just cannot use um, we cannot use those uh, basic uh, passive probes. You know, because Sometimes we need to we need to take a look at waveforms in all sorts of places inside our circuits, and by using just the passive probes, we will be short circuiting something inside of our circuit. So that's just one case. There are other cases in which we might want to use a differential probe. Okay, and for those of you that don't know, a differential probe uh, is essentially a kind of probe that allows us to uh, take a look uh, at any two points inside a circuit uh, without being afraid that we might create a short circuit somewhere because they will be um, separated from the inputs of the oscilloscope. So we will not have a common ground, so we will have the freedom to, to put them wherever we want. Now, there is a pretty big problem when it comes to these differential probes, and that is the fact that they cost insane amounts of money for what they are and what they do. Um, here where I live, uh, if I take a look at uh, one of the biggest um electronics uh, supplier uh, and i take a look at the cheapest differential probe that i can use for any oscilloscope it's it, it's more than 300 euros and it's it, being the cheapest one also means being one of the you know lowest quality and uh, performances <clears throat> not that that would be a huge problem but still 300 euros or sometimes even more if I take a look at Mouser which is a you know a global uh, electronic supply the cheapest uh, active differential probe costs about 400 euros or more and that's just ridiculous like honestly uh, by the way this is the cost of a cheap oscilloscope nowadays if you want to buy uh, an entire oscilloscope the the absolute cheapest ones are around 400 ish dollars you know at least where i live okay the, the price that we get here where i live uh, from what i've seen in the more uh, so-called developed countries where people win more money well, hey, they have bigger salaries prices tend to be cheaper there because yeah why not it makes sense that prices are higher for people that have less money but anyway that's a different topic um but still you know 
to pay 300 or 400 or even more euros for one single uh, differential probe to me is just insane and it's an absolute no-no so what do we do when we have a need for such a thing but we just can't afford to buy it well we build it ourselves because unlike an oscilloscope that we really cannot build at home it's a it's a pretty complex device from many points of view a differential probe is much much simpler and honestly this this is the fundamental reason why i just cannot understand why the prices are pretty much the same you know uh, a differential probe can easily be built by us amateurs at home without too big of a problem you know so this is what i'm going to show you in this particular video i have built a very cheap differential probe it doesn't have quite the same performances as the commercial ones but for us amateurs wanting to work with um, frequencies below the radio frequency spectrum it is good enough and it's dirt cheap at least compared to you know the prices of the products uh, uh, in the commerce um, this differential probe that i will show you right now costs about mm, the equivalent of 20 euros uh, the cost of components all of the components you know i i don't think i need to explain to you why <laughs> uh 20 euros and there's there's a huge difference between 20 euros and 300 400 you know um 20 euros is something that is uh, basically available for everyone no matter where we live no matter how poor we are uh 20 euros is not a problem to to uh, to put into these uh, components and build a differential probe that goes up to one megahertz yeah sure it's not that much uh typical um, differential probes go up to 25 megahertz but like i said for us amateurs we don't need in vast majority of cases we don't need more than one megahertz so this differential probe allows us to see signals up to one megahertz even up to three megahertz if we uh don't care that much about um, precise measurements and i will show you when i will uh, when i will show you a bit later the print screens that i've made from the various tests that i've done um you will see what i'm talking about but anyway we can definitely rely on it up to one megahertz it has um, two attenuation ratios um, times 10 or times 100 well i should say divide by 10 and divide by 100 but you know the the usual um, um how is it called um, <clears throat> the usual rule is that uh, this is expressed as times so anyway in times 10 we can have a maximum of 80 volts on its input on times 100 attenuation we can have up to 800 volts on the input which by the way it's actually slightly higher than commercially available ones which is maximum 600 volts anyway um it has a uh, four mega ohm in parallel with eight picofarads uh, input impedance and capacitance and a common mode rejection ratio of 48 decibels which is decent okay it's not bad it's not awesome either but it's decent for what we need and it has an extra uh, advantage which i don't see um, in commercially available products which is we can power it from a 9 volt battery now the uh, the vast majority of uh, commercially available differential probes come with a um, separate power supply that well just occupies space on our workbench and yeah it's something that we might want to avoid if possible sure there are advantages on having a separate power supply but 
anyway my differential probe um, is powered by a 9 volt battery and as a matter of fact half of this differential probe is composed of a um, boost converter a very primitive handmade boost converter okay so what we have here and i won't go into great details about this uh, this power supply because i've talked about it on my channel uh, in some videos and um, i should make this mention that for the uh, design and construction of this uh, uh, differential probe i've basically used all the knowledge i've learned in my last uh, five ish videos okay so on my um uh on my channel uh a month ago i posted a, a video about a teleche 555 timer and then um, there are four more videos regarding various different topics so i'm not gonna repeat myself basically when i've built this power supply i've combined all of them uh, we have um, here um, a small circuit with two, four resistors, two transistors and a LED. This is um, a low battery indicator, okay? And I've talked about it um, in my previous video, low battery indicator, three weeks ago. Um, then comes this rudimentary power supply that has a Teleche 555 uh, integrated circuit as a, a control circuit uh, and two separate inductors <coughs> that are charged in parallel and discharged in series. I have talked about all of this, okay, up until the C2 capacitor. Uh, I have talked about in this video primitive step up dc dc converter so i'm not going to get into details in this video if you want to understand how this works go back to that video what i will tell you is that in that video i had a potentiometer here to show you various um, output voltages but for this project, I needed a fixed uh, voltage, so I only uh, placed two resistors here. That uh, allows me to have a uh, give or take 31 volts voltage on the output of this uh, switch mode power supply, essentially, of this boost converter. And in, uh, in continuation of this boost converter, because this has a, a certain ripple that I'm not very fond of and I, I, I would like to have uh, less ripple. Um, I have placed a linear power supply, a linear uh, very low power power supply that's made, made from a um, uh, constant current circuit made with T5 and T6 transistors and uh, a circuit that basically emulates a Zener diode made with these three transistors T8, T7 and T9 and about this circuit I spoke in uh, Zener replacement V3 video a month ago okay so again I'm not going into great details about it the advantage of this circuit instead of just using a Zener diode is that a typical Zener diode, especially at low voltages, uh, requires about 5 milliamps of current in order to work properly. Well, I wanted a lot less uh, because the switch mode power supply that I've built is not all that powerful. So th the more current we draw from it, the more the voltage drops. <clears throat> And this is a problem. Um, I've designed this power supply to work with uh, as low as 6 volts because a 9 volt battery, when it gets too consumed, it can get down to 6 volts uh, or, or even less. But typically, if it, it, if it gets down uh, lower than 6 volts, it no longer has the necessary power to power anything really. So this switch mode power supply can provide 31 volts on the output even with only 6 volts on the input. 
Now I need 26 volts for um, for the output voltage that I will send to the rest of the circuit to power. I will explain in a moment why 26 volts. Um, so in order to have um, a better ripple rejection and 26 volts, I decided that I need 31 volts from the switch mode power supply and then I'm further stabilizing it with this particular circuit and like I said instead of using a Zener diode that requires 5 milliamps I can use this circuit that requires only 500 microamps so 10 times less current okay which is a huge advantage for this particular project for this um, uh, for this thing that we're building right so essentially this uh, uh, constant current source is equivalent to the simple resistor that we place in series with a zener diode um, this uh, circuit with three transistors and three resistors uh, is the equivalent of a zener diode and then i am taking this um, this voltage, this relatively constant voltage that's being provided by this pseudo Zenor diode, and I'm further filtering it with R6 and uh, C5, C6. This is an RC filter, uh, essentially, and this voltage gets fed into uh, the base of T4, which is, acts like a so called pass transistor um, that. Uh, on its emitter relative to the the, the ground uh, it provides 26 volts that we then uh, use to feed all the rest of the circuit and so basically this half uh, the, the upper half of this entire circuit is just the power supply that is able to take uh, the 9 volt battery uh, the, the 9 volts from the 9 volts battery which can get down to 6 volts and it can give us 26 volts constantly on the output okay and the lower half of this entire circuit is the actual differential probe uh, so basically this gives us the advantage of just having a 9 volt battery stuck inside uh, the 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 case of uh, the, the chassis of the um, differential probe and therefore we don't need an extra cable and an extra power supply on the bench we have less cables so um, the whole space is uh, you know cleaner the, the our workspace basically um, now why 26 volts well there are <laughs> There are basically uh, a couple of uh, a couple of reasons, a couple of um, um, conditions that um, kind of went head to head with each other. You know, um, from a certain perspective, we need as higher voltage as possible. From another perspective, we cannot have more than a certain value because the uh, operational amplifier that we will use. Uh, to build this differential probe obviously has a maximum uh, power supply voltage okay so um, these two conditions uh, that basically pull in opposite directions um, we, we have to work with them and the, uh, the the middle ground to call it like this is uh, basically a, a compromise for this particular uh, integrated circuit, the compromise was 26 volts. The vast majority of cheap uh, operational amplifiers can work with 30, 32 volts, sometimes 38 volts in total, uh, the power supply. But um, here's the thing, and here's why 26 volts this this uh, differential probe essentially takes a signal on the output on the input and throws another signal uh, on the output which is more or less a mirror of the input signal and this output signal gets sent to an oscilloscope okay now if we 
take a look at the vast majority of oscilloscopes, if not every single one of them, um, we see that we have a center line and then we have a number of vertical divisions upwards and vertical divisions downwards. And this number seems to be four. Four divisions uh, up and four divisions down. Okay, so this gives us eight divisions in total per um, per vertical. Well, uh, we can have a different number of volts per division. And in order for us to see a signal as well as possible, right, we will uh, adjust this volts per division so that um, our signal feels as much space from the screen and now here comes the, the the tricky part if this signal comes from another circuit like our differential probe then that circuit needs to be able to you know provide the this voltage that we need so if we set a uh, too high voltage per division here we might find that um, the previous circuit, our differential probe in this case, just cannot provide that voltage. Okay. If we choose, for example, 5 volts per division, then we will have plus minus 20 volts uh, in order to fill the entire screen. Uh, and that's 40 volts in total. Well, the vast majority of operational amplifiers uh, cannot work with 40 volts. And even if you can provide 40 volts uh, on the power rails, the output voltage will definitely be lower than that. Okay. So 40 volts is a bit too much. So what's the next uh, lowest, uh, the, uh, the next lower uh, level? Well, if we have 2 volts per division, then we have plus minus 8 volts. Okay. So we have uh, 2, 4, 6, 8 on the positive side and 8 volts on the negative side. That's 16 volts in total. Okay. So, um, 16 volts is doable. Most of the op amps that... Um, allow us to power them with uh, plus minus 15 volts uh, plus minus 16 um, sometimes a little bit more they are able to provide us with plus minus 8 on the output so if we uh, provide 2 volts per division for um, for our oscilloscope it seems to be good enough we can surely go down to 1 volt or even below 1 volt per division. Um, and that, of course, gives us um, an increased possibility of using even more um, operational amplifiers. Uh, sometimes including those that can only handle 5 volts on the power supply, uh, supply rail. But the problem is the, the lower the voltage we um, choose to have, the more noise we will have on the screen. Okay. Um, this is the noise of my oscilloscope, for example, uh, when I'm connecting it to a circuit that doesn't give anything. Uh, but my oscilloscope still sees about 10 millivolts peak to peak, uh, 3.5 millivolts uh, RMS of uh, noise just noise okay so it's clear that we must choose the maximum voltage uh, that we can possibly choose so that we can minimize the noise okay and based on these constraints two volts per division like i said seems to be the best one the best choice two volts per division means that we need uh, plus minus eight so 16 volts um, 16 volts, uh, a range of 16 volts uh, to be given from the from our circuit, which is the you know differential probe. Now, in order for us to to use uh, this very cheap uh, operational amplifier that can 
officially go up to 3 megahertz practically it actually goes um, it goes lower it goes only up to 1 megahertz um, we need uh, an actually higher voltage than this 16 to to power it because uh, according to the data sheet of Tulu 074 um, we need about five volts more um, than the actual output voltage okay we need about uh, if i remember correctly three volts more for the positive rail two volts more for the negative rail something like that so um if we want 16 volts plus five that's uh, what 21 volts um but i chose uh, obviously i chose to be safe and have an even higher voltage than the minimum that i need so instead of 21 i chose 26 another five extra volts okay so this is how i ca uh, came up with uh 26 volts uh, power voltage so that even if something happens around here and the voltage goes a bit lower like i don't know 25 or 24 um this uh these op amps will still work and it will still work well okay good now uh let's move on to the next problem that uh, i've had when i've designed this we need a ground and relative to that ground we need to have both positive and negative voltages okay um because the entire concept of this uh differential probe is to basically have um a dual um, voltage divider on the input relative to a ground and then uh, we would get two different volts uh, voltages with two different signals that would enter in two different buffers of uh, what's called an instrumentation amplifier and then uh, we would have uh, these two signals uh, sent into a differential amplifier uh, which is just part the, the the second part of uh, the, the second half of uh, an instrumentation amplifier and then this whole instrumentation amplifier gives us a signal the, the final signal that we throw on the output that can take both positive and negative uh, values right so in order for us to have both positive and negative we need to have a ground that is well somewhere in between two these two extremes the positive extreme and a negative extreme the problem is from this power supply we only get one voltage okay um so we need to create this ground since we don't have it we need to create it so for that we have uh, well i have used a very simple trick um since i am using a quad op amp and i'm uh, for for strictly speaking for the amplifier section i'm only using the three op amps i still have one op amp left free to you know do whatever i want with it so we can use this op amp as a buffer we can feed uh, on its uh, positive input um uh, a voltage that is exactly half the power supply voltage and on the output we would have the exact voltage but we would be able to draw some current because this op amp will take care of uh, the output voltage remaining constant relative to the input voltage okay so that's why we have this voltage divider uh row 13 and row 14 with two relatively big uh, resistors that must be equal in value i've chosen 108 uh, 180 kilo ohms but i could have gone even higher and i've also put a c7 uh, capacitor here to filter any potential uh, fluctuations so that this point relative to the negative rail remains constant okay so now we have the ground that we need and then uh now that we have the ground we can um we can have all the rest so <clears throat> we need to have a voltage divider on the input and 
in, in, in order for us to have a differential input, we need to have two voltage dividers, one for each uh, connector, one, of, one for each wire on the input uh, relative to the ground. And this is what we see here. We have a uh, RU15 and RU16, two resistors, one megohm in uh, each in series with uh, RU18 and RU23, RU23 being a semi-adjustable potentiometer. Um, this forms a uh, one voltage divider that we will need to set up to uh, drop down uh, to 10%. So we, we will need to have a 10 to one attenuation ratio, okay? And we have another voltage divider here with RU30, RU31, RU28 and RU26 which is identical with uh, the other one except for the other wire from the input okay this is the input so what these two voltage dividers give um, is basically two different voltages that are 10 times um, well <laughs> each of them are 20 times um, smaller than the input uh, signal okay and they are both relative to the ground and they are also out of phase because if we put uh, the positive here and the negative here um the input voltage you know then we have here a positive voltage relative to the ground and here we have a negative voltage relative to the ground and this is perfectly fine because even though it's 20 times, each of these are 20 times smaller than the input voltage, um, through the entire uh, amplifier circuit, it will uh, it will get to be amplified, and in the end, we will have uh, 10 times um, smaller voltage than the input not 20 times okay this is because since this is a differential amplifier it will make the difference between these two signals but if one is positive the other is negative when you when you have uh, when you subtract a negative number it's exactly like as if you would uh, add the the same number but positive one okay so <clears throat> by having uh, a 20 times uh, less signal here and a 20 times l less smaller signal here but in reverse um if you if, if you calculate the subtraction the difference between them then you get a 10 times uh, smaller signal okay <clears throat> And this is why uh, R23 and uh, uh, RU26 are, um, are adjustable, because we need to adjust these so that um, the voltage here is precisely 10 times uh, smaller than the voltage on the input. Well, precisely 20 times smaller, but I will get to, uh, to the point where I will discuss about adjustments and uh, we will see that in order to make our lives easier, we will inject uh, signals uh, into just one of the inputs and uh, we will uh, inject them relative to the ground. But anyway, I'll talk a little bit later about how to, um, you know, set up how to, how to adjust uh, everything that needs to be adjusted. Um, now this gives us one attenuation factor um we said that we wanted um, two attenuations factor and we want to switch between them so for that we can use a sepedete um, switch like single single pole double throw switch right and with it we can basically connect or disconnect to the ground uh, another set of resistors and capacitors but i will talk about them in a moment another set of resistors that basically uh, if placed in parallel with these resistors they will of course diminish the overall resistance and overall instead of having a 1 to 10 divider we would have a 1 to 100 divider okay <clears throat> So this is why we have uh, another set of uh, fixed resistor plus uh, semi-adjustable potentiometer here, both on the positive and on the negative side. So 
now that we have um, we have obtained two smaller signals from our input signal and they are both uh, relative to our ground and uh, they are out of phase to each other we need to send them to a couple of buffers okay that are part of our instrumentation amplifier by the way if you don't know what an instrumentation amplifier is Search it on YouTube because there are uh, plenty of uh, videos out there that explain it. Also, there's a page on Wikipedia that you can read and it's pretty good. That's where I learned all that I needed to know. And then by just experimenting a little bit, um, I was able to... Um, I was able to, you know, understand what's all about uh, an instrumentation amplifier. This is why I'm not explaining it, because there are plenty of resources on the internet that will help you learn it. Okay, so uh, an instrumentation amplifier is basically made of two buffers, um, which can also have an amplification factor. So they, it's not always that they are buffers, sometimes they are actually non-inverting amplifiers. Uh, in my case, they are just buffers because I don't want to amplify the signal at all. And then uh, both signals get fed to a differential amplifier, which is just another op-amp with four resistors placed in the typical configuration of a differential amplifier. Okay, so um, before we inject these signals into uh, our buffers, we need to make sure that no matter what voltage we have on the input, the voltage on these uh, op-amp inputs, because buffers are only op-amps, right? But the voltage on these op-amp inputs uh, never exceed a certain range that is safe for them. And for that, I have placed four diodes, two each for, uh, two for each uh, signal. And they are placed like this, uh, with um, uh, the upper diode uh, connected between um, the signal uh, on its anode and the positive su power supply rail uh, on its cathode. And then the lower diode with uh, its cathode connected to the signal and its anode connected to the negative power supply, supply rail. Okay, so if I am to uh, color this with purple you see this is the negative power supply rail okay and uh if i am to color this with purple you see this is the positive power supply rail okay good so um this makes sure that if this voltage for whatever reasons goes higher than the positive power supply rail um d4 will start conducting and this point will never go higher than that and the same thing happens for um, um, for uh, negative uh, excursions if the voltage here drops below or tends to drop below the negative power supply rail then d5 will start conducting and it will not allow it it will not allow it to go uh, above that power supply rail plus uh, the voltage drop on the diode. Now, uh, here's a bit of a problem um, with what I've created here. It's not a huge problem, but when you will create it uh, for yourself, if you choose to do so, uh, it would be best if you would not add Schottky diodes. Uh, at least not these ones. I've chosen Sebe 130. The problem is uh, with Schottky diodes, and especially these ones, they have... Um, they have a leakage current uh, that goes in reverse, okay? So normally a, a diode blocks current that wants to enter through its cathode and exit through its anode. And yeah, sure, uh, a Schottky diode does that as well, but sadly it doesn't do it any, um, any way as good as uh, rectifying diode or another kind of diode so it will um, it will allow a very small current to pass through it in the order of microamperes sadly this is good enough to screw with uh, our voltage divider 
and this is one of the reasons why i have chosen here pretty large values for these two semi-adjustable potentiometers this upper one has 50 kilo ohms this lower one has 25 kilo ohms when in fact uh, mathematically speaking a uh, 5 kilo ohm one should have been uh, good enough but because we have this leakage current here it's not good enough so my advice to you would be to not place Schottky diodes here but place some uh, some rectifying diodes perhaps that go uh, up to you know one megahertz or more and then you can use only five kilo ohm uh, semi-adjustables here um, otherwise you'll have to use higher values like i did okay good now uh now that we have the signal um uh, I will explain this uh, up until the end and then I'll come back and explain the capacitors here because we have quite a few capacitors and you might wonder why exactly. And some capacitors are a bit special because they need to withstand um, higher voltage. Um, now that we have signals and we are uh, feeding them into buffers, we can um, then calculate the difference between them. And this is why we have this differential amplifier inside of our, um, you know, uh, uh, instrumentation amplifier. But um, in my case, I didn't want it to have any um, amplification factor whatsoever because I wanted to have uh, the maximum bandwidth that's available to us. The problem is each each uh, amplifier has um, a certain gain bandwidth product associated with it and what gain bandwidth product means is that the amplifier's maximum frequency depends on the amplification factor and vice versa. So the higher we choose the amplification factor the lower the frequency that we can work with that amplifier gets. Because, uh, you know, uh, the, um, Tele 071, 2 and 4 have uh, a unity gain bandwidth of 3 MHz, typical, but practically it can only go to 1 MHz from, from my tests, um, from, from my practical experiments, you know, I, in, in order to, to actually have this bandwidth in my differential probe, I needed to have it uh, have its amplification factor set to one. In other words, I need it not to amplify the signal at all, because any amplification factor will decrease the maximum frequency. Right. So this is why all of these four resistors that are uh, typical for a differential amplifier have the exact same value. Okay, having four val uh, four resistors of exact same value means that you have no amplification whatsoever. And in order for us to not have uh, problems with uh, common mode, uh, they have to be uh, their values need to be very very precise, very close to each other. So I chose 10 kilo ohm resistors of 0.1 uh, tolerance okay there are resistors with even higher tolerance but they cost more and it doesn't make all that much sense 0.1 percent tolerance is pretty good for what we need here uh, and they are also relatively cheap so we can buy 20 of them or 50 of them or even 100 of them at once so that we can use four of them here and the rest in other projects okay um, also, the value here is not all that uh, important. I could have gone with other values instead of 10 kilo ohm. However, um, 10 kilo ohm is the absolute maximum value that we can use for this particular circuit, uh, this particular op amp, so that we do not have a problem with these parasitic input capacitances. Okay. Uh, and I'll talk about them uh, in a moment. <clears throat> if we choose higher 
uh, value resistors, then these resistors with those parasitic capacitances will form uh, RC uh, low pass filters that will filter, will, will cut the frequencies below one megahertz, and we don't want that. So, if you choose other uh, resistors, you can have lower value resistors, but not higher value ones. Okay, and like I said, choose higher precision resistors, so basically lower tolerance ones. Okay, um, the 50 ohm resistor on the output is typical for um, for such circuits, you know, because um, it's a good practice to match the impedance of uh, 50 ohm coaxial cables if we choose to use such cables. Um, what else do we have here? Oh, we have a couple of more um, semi-adjustable potentiometers with uh, some fixed, uh, relatively high-value resistors and a couple of smaller ones here. So, I've said that these are buffers. Now, a typical buffer um, has the minus input connected to the output directly, okay? Not through a resistor. However, uh, we want to compensate the offset in, input offset voltage of these two um, uh, of these two buffers. In order to do that, we need to inject a very small voltage in the minus input of each of these op amps. Okay. If we have this input connected directly to the output, we will not able to we will not be able to um, inject any voltage whatsoever in it so for that i needed to put uh, a small value resistor here i chose 1.8 kilo ohms it seems to be good enough uh, there's actually a formula that um uh with which we can calculate um uh, how big the range of the voltages that we inject here are based on you know these resistors i'm not gonna go into it 1.8 kilo ohms uh with another resistor of one meg ohm connected to uh, a semi-adjustable potentiometer that is connected to both power rails okay uh is good enough for us to be able to inject a, a signal here that is uh something like plus minus 20 millivolts or so which is good enough to compensate the input offset voltage of up to 13 millivolts, plus minus 13 millivolts, that this uh, Tele 070 something op amp has. Okay, so this is why we have this uh, pair of um, fixed resistor plus adjustable resistor plus an extra resistor here, in spite of the fact that we have buffers here so we don't really have uh, an amplification factor whatsoever okay and that's pretty much it uh, now i need to explain what is with all of these capacitors here well here's the problem um i've just mentioned earlier uh, that it, every uh op amp has an input parasitic uh, capacitance well actually it has two input ca parasitic capacitance uh one a common mode one associated with its common mode and one associated with its differential mode and i've talked about this in my second previous video op amp parasitic input capacitances so i highly suggest you take a look at that video to understand the concept okay the problem is when you have a resistor placed in a series with a capacitor you have a low pass filter and it doesn't matter that you don't have an actual capacitor. If you have something that has capacitance, it is good enough for it to behave like a low-pass filter. And that's a problem because we're not going to be able to achieve even 1 megahertz if we don't compensate for this problem. And in order to, um, in order to show you this, um, I can actually have a, a simulation in microcap. Okay, uh, I'm gonna disable uh, these capacitors because these are used for uh, for um, compensation. And let's let's say that we have here um, a ten to one, uh, or I should say a one to ten 
um, input divider, right? That takes an input signal, um, divides it its amplitude by 10, and then feeds it into an op amp. But like I said, this op amp has some parasitic capacitances, which are C1, C2, and C3 in my simulation. Also, any um, any diode in reverse uh, polarization also presents a parasitic capacitance, okay? So we have four diodes here, one for each channel. I'm simulating here a single channel, so I only have two capacitance, uh, capacitors here, C6 and C7. They are, um, they are representative for the parasitic capacitances of the diodes, okay? So these two are not actual capacitors in my circuit they are actually the diodes and these three are not actual capacitors they are just parasitic capacitances inside the actual op amp if we have only this voltage divider and nothing else and we run uh, an alternative current analysis so from analysis we go to ac and i will choose to go up to from one hertz up to one megahertz um and of course i will want to see you know the output of the op amp um, how it performs and i click on run uh surprise surprise <laughs> i don't go anywhere near uh one megahertz in fact so uh, an attenuation of 10 means minus 20 decibels so we see here a flat line of minus 20 decibels which is absolutely fine and normal and exactly what we want that goes up to about 2 kilohertz and from 2 kilohertz we slowly start to attenuate more up until some i don't know six or seven kilohertz uh from which we go down I'm guessing 20 decibels per decade because that's the usual slope that we get uh, from an RC filter, okay? And like I said, we want to get up to 1 megahertz because our op amp allows us to get up to 1 megahertz. However, this circuit at 1 megahertz has a minus 63-ish attenuation, which is, I don't know, a one to one thousand i believe so from one to ten we have dropped down to one to one thousand and we have varying degrees of attenuation in the frequencies in between these and this is just not acceptable okay so we need to compensate for these parasitic capacitances in these components and what do we do for that well we have to add some more capaci capacitors so we need to add some more capacitance, but in order to add more capacitance in different places, then we need to add actual capacitors, okay? So this is why we have here these two, uh, well, four capacitors of 33 picofarads each, two for each branch, one for each resistor. <clears throat> um, by the way, I forgot to mention we need to add two resistors in series instead of just one resistor of double the value because if we are to handle high voltages we need to be able not to burn our resistors um, something that is very often overlooked is that a resistor has um, a maximum voltage okay and it's not just given by its resistance and its dissipation power it's actually a maximum voltage that it can work with so even if the current is small enough through it that the dissipation power is not too big if the voltage is too big then that resistor might burn or might and might cause a short circuit even which is actually worse so um the typical um, maximum value maximum voltage of 0.25 watt resistors that we are you know usually usually using throughout our circuits uh is 250 volts so in order for us to handle a maximum of 800 volts um that we can use for the times 100 attenuation factor we need to use four resistors in total for our voltage divider at least four you know 
so this is why i have two resistors of one megom each for each branch and uh, i've placed a 33 picofarads uh, capacitor in parallel with each of them and also these capacitors need to be high voltage ones so i found cheap 33 picofarad capacitors that go up to 500 volts each that's more than enough because they will never see e even half of this they will never see okay so uh if we put 33 in series we will get an equivalent capacitance of 16.5 uh, micro uh, 16.5 pico farads okay and this is why we have this um uh this is why we have this capacitor here is the equivalent of those two 33 pico farad ones and if i activate it now we see that we get a different graph okay we actually see a small amplification after a certain frequency and it goes up to uh, above one megahertz and then it goes down but it goes down due to the op amp okay the op amp itself now it's better but it's still not okay because we would like a flat line here uh, at least a flat and as flat line as possible so for that we need to add um another capacitor here in parallel with all the parasitic capacitances and i have c5 here and we need to uh, size it appropriately and for this particular circuit it happens to be 22 picofarads okay now the logic behind it is that the ratio between uh this resistor r1 and this one r2 needs to be exactly the ratio between all of these capacitances here and this capacitance here c4 in my case okay so the ratios are basically reversed r1 over r2 uh, needs to be equal to the capacitances uh, in parallel with R2 over the capacitances in parallel with R1. Okay, and this is why 22 picofarads here do the trick because we have four uh, picofarads of differential mode uh, parasitic capacitance for the op amp, one picofarad for the common mode. Um, and we have uh, determined these uh, through various ex um, um, uh, through various um, experiments that we've done in this particular video and also we have the parasitic capacitance of the diodes the protective diodes which i've estimated at around 60 picofarads this is not something uh, easy uh, it, it, you cannot calculate it through mathematics you have to take a look at the data sheet of your um, your diodes uh, and i've picked uh, the vichy data sheet for sb100 and something it's an entire family of uh, of um, Schottky diodes and at some point we see a graph that shows us typical junction capacitance and we see that it's actually a function of the temperature and a function of the reverse voltage and also it depends on the model of the diode so things are not that easy you cannot calculate this you you have to estimate it you know based on a graph like this and based on this particular graph and the fact that i've used the sb130 diodes and i have about 16 volts across them um no, about 13 sorry um because i have 26 volts and two diodes so about 13 volts across each of them well i, I have estimated around 60 the uh, picofarads of uh, parasitic capacitance here and so this is why i've put 60 here so with all these parasitic capacitances here and these two uh, capacitors here of 32 pico picofarads each then i need to have uh, 22 picofarads each and as we can see we then have a flat line up until over one megahertz at least in the um, simulation okay so this explains uh, all of these um, all of these capacitors they are 
essentially compensating in frequency and also these two capacitors of 1.5 nanofarad each well it, it, the idea is that if you change the ratio here of uh, the the resistor divider ratio then you yeah, you automatically have to change the capacitances as well okay so if i were to change this to 20.2 kilo ohms which is the equivalent of uh, you know 1 to 100 divider ratio um, I see that I have a minus 40 decibel attenuation, which is 1 to 100, but 22 picofarads is no longer good enough because at some frequencies this attenuation actually decreases. So this is why I will need about 1.5 nanofarads for this uh, divider uh, in order to have a pretty flat line of around minus 40 decibels. Okay, so this pretty much explains everything in terms of uh, how i've designed this differential um, probe you know and the fact that i've used um, all of these components uh, gives me a very cheap differential probe because the op amps are cheap uh, really everything the, the tlc 555 is not that expensive all of these transistors are cheap the diodes are cheap everything is cheap okay so this is how we can get a differential probe that goes up to one megahertz which is good enough for dc it's good enough for ac um power supplies it's good enough for audio frequency circuits and it's also good enough for switch mode power supplies the vast majority of switch mode power supplies work with around 100 kilohertz give or take switching frequency so us being able to go up to 10 times that frequency is good enough and instead of buying instead of paying 300 400 or even more euros or dollars you know we can just have a, 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 the differential probe for uh, 20 dollars or euros which is great okay um now uh, i'm i need to show you three more things quickly um one i need to explain the adjustments so uh, obviously since we have semi-adjustable resistors and we have six of them <laughs> we need to be able to adjust them okay um because that's why we put adjustable ones instead of fixed ones and uh, the adjustment process is like this we first need to power this entire circuit okay we need to so basically we need to put a 9 volt battery that's good enough not one that's completely depleted um in order for us to have this whole circuit powered so that these for protection diodes to not start to conduct okay with uh, the circuit powered we need to perform some uh, tricks um, and we need to basically inject uh, a voltage into the input relative to the ground and we need to do this um, twice one for each of the input um, pins okay so i will i will explain to you only for the positive side uh, but you need to do the exact same thing for the negative side as well so you need to take a constant uh, well-known um, voltage source and to apply it to uh, one of these uh, pins of the input pins relative to the ground okay i've used for the sake of simplicity i've used a 10 volt um a power supply that i was able to set to 10 volts and that was stable enough okay and i used the most precise uh, multimeter that i've had uh, in my lab so if we apply let's say let's go with this example if we apply a 10 volt uh voltage uh into one of the inputs and the ground we need to adjust R23 to the point where here in this point we have only one volt okay because this needs to be a 1 to 10 divider when we have one volt here um, and, and it's precisely if we have precisely 10 volts on the input we need to have precisely one volt or as close to one volt as possible on the output here 
then uh, we can switch on this uh, this uh, switch okay so we can uh, place this into 1 to 100 ratio and suddenly of course the voltage here will drop and we need to adjust row 22 so that the voltage here is 100 millivolts which is exactly 10 volts divided by 100 okay so we adjust root 22 we leave uh, we leave alone r23 that's set we no longer touch it we adjust root 22 so that we have here 100 millivolts okay and when we have here uh, 100 millivolts precisely or as close as possible we switch this back to uh, times 10 so that we have back one volt here and uh, we we measure also relative to the to, to the ground we measure the output voltage of the buffer here okay and it's gonna be more or less uh, one volt okay remember we've set this back to 10 uh, 1 to 10 uh, attenuation factors so if we have 10 volts on the input we will have one volt on on the output of the divider and because this is this needs to be a buffer it also needs to give us one volt on its output well because of the input offset voltage it will probably not give us one volt on the output so for that we need to adjust root 32 uh, so that we get as close as one volt on the output of the buffer here as well okay and these are all the three uh, adjustments that we need to do for the positive side and then we need to do the same thing for the negative side so we we apply the same let's say 10 volts stable voltage uh, on the other uh, input pin relative to the ground and now we need to do the exact same uh, tricks with uh, 26 for one volt here then switch this to times 100 adjust root 29 for 100 millivolts here then switch back to times 10 and uh take a look at the other buffers output and adjust uh, you know root 33 so that we have one volt here on its output and that's it these are all the adjustments all the six adjustments that need to be made and when we have made these adjustments, well, um, we should have a pretty good differential probe that's also extremely cheap. Now, before I go into how I've built this, let me show you some uh, performances, okay? Let, let me show you some things <clears throat> so that you can uh, better understand how good this differential probe is. Um... So, uh, for the first thing, when you build this, of course, um, we will want to build the power supply separately from the rest of the circuit so that we can test it and make sure that it works separately. So, um, we can take a look at a few things at the power supply besides the fact that it gives us, you know, here plus 31 volts and here plus 26 volts. Um, we can uh, we can take a look with the oscilloscope to see some uh, finer details for example the ripples that we have right so this is how the voltage looks like at the very output so uh, the output 26 volts after uh, the linear um, uh, the linear uh, supply circuit uh, if we don't have any load whatsoever okay we have 5 millivolts per division, we see we have about uh, 10 millivolts peak to peak with some occasional peaks going above that and uh, my oscilloscope says about 3 millivolts RMS of um, ripple. Uh, when we connect a 10 milliamp load and 10 milliamp is, is going to be the, the current that this entire circuit is going to draw more or less uh, if we apply a 10 milliamp uh, load, then um, the ripple here becomes kind of like this. We have 10 millivolts per division, so we have about two divisions of ripple voltage, 5 millivolts RMS. Okay, uh, and this is 
again at the output of this uh, linear um, power supply that goes after the switch mode power supply to smooth things out. And if we take a look at the, the previous um, point, the one with 31 volts, basically the output of the switch mode power supply, then we see a slightly bigger ripple, a three times bigger ripple. Okay, we see 20 millivolts per division and the ripple is kind of three divisions, right? Um, and here it says about 14 millivolts RMS ripple. So it's clear that by adding this, uh, this extra, you know, um, pseudo Zener circuit uh, stabilization, um, we are getting an improvement that, uh, you know, makes a, makes a difference. The, the smoother the power voltage we give to our op amps, um, the less noise we will have on the output. Okay, so it, it, it wasn't um, an overkill to add that extra circuit. It was actually something that brought some improvement. Um, now, if, I, if, if we take a look just uh, at the noise on the oscilloscope, it's about 10 millivolts peak to peak. So... Yeah, it's something to be considering when we are looking at this or this as well. Anyhow, leaving the power supply alone, if the power supply does its job, now let's take a look at uh, the actual, you know, um, differential probe, the actual um, amplifier, attenuator and amplifier circuit. I've run uh, tests uh, separately. Uh, on the positive side and on the negative side because it's kind of impossible or at least I don't know how to test both of them at the same time so I I've tested half of this uh, amplification circuit separately from the other half um, and well uh, I've run a, a frequency response analysis basically or a body plot um, for the positive side, for the um, 1 to 10 attenuation ratio, uh, we have a pretty good response, minus 20 decibels, more or less, up until 1 megahertz, okay? And then uh, we have a decrease in attenuation, or, well, an amplification if you want to call it like that, and then we, we have a, um, uh, a drop in this response, which is absolutely normal because, again, I'm using a, an IC, uh, an op-amp, that is officially uh, guaranteed up to 3 MHz only. Okay. So this is why I said that um, our differential uh, probe can go up to 1 MHz, but if you don't care that much about precise measurements, if having a 5 decibel error is good enough for you, then it can go up to 3 MHz without a problem okay <clears throat> uh we're taking a look at the blue uh waveform by the way the, the the blue graph not the red one the red one is the face but we don't care and um taking a look at the negative uh, circuit uh we see that we have almost an identical um response the differences are very very small i'm going back and forth between them so these two circuits are pretty well matched at least in my case the circuits that i've built okay uh, doing the same frequency response analysis but for 1 to 100 um attenuation ratio uh, we also see this more or less flat line of minus 40 decibels which again means 1 to 100, up until the same 1 megahertz. It's true that it's not as flat as for the 1 to 10. This is due to the fact that, well, my 1.5 nanofarad capacitors were actually less <laughs> than 1.5. I should have placed extra capacitors in parallel to bring them up to 1.5 nano, but I didn't care that much. I didn't really care all that much. This is a good enough response for me. The difference is about 3 decibels uh, from the lowest frequency up to 1 megahertz. 3 decibels is not that big of a deal for me. Okay, For uh, 1 to 100 ratio, which I will very rarely use 
in my case. Uh, also, this is for the positive half of the circuit, and this is for the negative half of the circuit. Again, going back and forth between them, we see that the differences aren't all that big. Okay. Another thing that is worth um analyzing to a differential um probe is the common mode rejection ratio so what is the common mode rejection ratio basically if we place the exact same signal on both uh input uh, wires relative to the ground if we have an ideal um, um uh, probe then we should have zero volts on the output however because we are not dealing with uh, ideal components and uh, circuits we will have some signal on the output that is caused um, uh, that is due to various imperfections and it's due to the common mode voltage which is basically the the voltage between any of the two inputs and the ground now, if we take a look at uh, this uh, Geve Instec um, uh, probe, the, the cheapest commercially available ones, um, in its data sheet, it says that it has a CMRR uh, of, well, it, it depends. Um, at 60 hertz it says it's above 80 decibels at 100 above 60 and at 1 megahertz above 50 decibels so basically this ratio depends on the frequency as well well mine is slightly worse but it's it's still pretty close like i've said here that i have 48 decibels well this is actually something that we can test with another frequency response analysis but specific for CMRR and for the um, times 10 attenuation um, we see that well we have about 48 decibels like I said from the smallest frequency up until some I don't know 800 kilohertz or so and we actually have even uh, an even better common mode rejection ratio uh, in the frequencies between I don't know 2 and 3 kilohertz up until I don't know 200 kilohertz or so we have the best uh, the best CMRR here at about I don't know 50 kilohertz it, I think it is it's about 70 minus minus 70 decibels CMRR so yeah it's not that bad um, also for the times 100 uh, attenuation factor we have minus 70 decibels constant and we, we even reach minus 90 decibels for some frequencies and of course as close as we get to 1 megahertz uh, the CMRR becomes a, 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 a bit worse you know just like with uh, times 10 attenuation at 1 megahertz we see that we have a CMRR of only 38 ish um, for the times 100 we have about 54 ish um, <clears throat> it's a bit unclear uh, here from the specifications you know um, for what attenuation factor do we get this CMRR because these particular probes have uh, different attenuation factors and uh, some of them have even four different attenuation factor so CMRR ob obviously depends on uh, the attenuation factor as well uh, it leaves to be questioned uh, you know these numbers what for what attenuation factor they are anyhow <coughs> what we have here is a pretty good result so yeah one more reason for us to build this 20 dollar um differential probe instead of buying commercially available ones for more than 10 times and um finally let's take a look at some waveforms because i wanted to see um uh, i wanted to see waveforms as well not just um a simple frequency response analysis but i wanted to see if you know my my uh, differential probe is distorting in a way um signals or not and well it's doing a pretty good job we have 
the the signal from the input from the signal generator we have it with uh, purple here and with red we have the signal from the output of um from the output of my differential probe it's actually the mathematical channel um i've had to recompose this signal from two different signals i i had to use two different channels to probe um each output wire from here uh and then recompose it using the mathematical um channel of the oscilloscope because otherwise i i, I just couldn't have done this but anyway, and I've also put some uh, some um, um, some cursors here um, that I've uh, set to 500 millivolts distance between them, and we can see that on the input signal we have uh, uh, five volts peak to peak, uh, and on the output we have uh, this red waveform that uh, goes back and forth between uh, these two cursors set at 500 millivolts which is exactly what we needed i've done these tests on the 1 to 10 uh, divider ratio okay so this is exactly what uh, we needed to have from 5 volts divided to uh, 1 to 10 to 500 millivolts and this is at 100 hertz something similar we get at 1 kilohertz um, something similar to 10 kilohertz we see just a very small attenuation here but it's uh, it's small enough that it's negligible at 100 kilohertz again we see the same thing uh, ignore by the way ignore the fact that uh, the two waveforms the purple and the red one are out of phase uh, it's due to the fact that i've calculated things in reverse but we don't care about the phase here we only care about the shape of the waveform and um, um, the, the amplitude okay and at one megahertz um well again we see the signal um, that is pretty good and we also see that it's slightly amplified um, just a little bit <clears throat> but it's not by much so uh, in decibels it's it's a small difference okay so this shows us that um um our um, very cheap uh, differential probe is good enough for our uh, hobby lab you know and it can uh, it can help us um, save quite a lot of money now let me show you at last um the pcb layout uh because i need to you know clarify a few things so I actually have three PCBs, one just for the power supply, the switch mode um, step up power supply or boost power supply, however you want to call it. Like I said, I needed to build it separately so that I can test it separately. But also it makes it made sense because it occupies uh, 10 centimeters by 2.5 centimeters or 100 millimeters by 25 millimeters, however you want to express yourself. It's a pretty big power supply because, well, we, we are creating it ourselves. Of course, you could potentially just buy one from the market, you know, and be done with it. I wanted to build one because I'm studying these things anyway. Uh, so I, I wanted to build one myself for the sake of seeing how it is to make one. Now, um, from the battery, you need to come with three wires uh the the negative one is here when it's where it's bat minus and the positive one you actually have to take it to uh two places uh, one in this point and one in this point okay uh, i couldn't root um, um a, a copper trace from here to here so you have to bring the positive um, pole from the battery here um, in both places at the same time something similar happens with um, the um, <clears throat> the board for the actual amplifier by the way the output of this power supply is here 
out plus and out minus you're gonna have to to connect the two wires here that you will have to bring actually in two different places on the board with the amplifier uh, so basically you'll have to connect four wires in total um, the positive wire um, the, po the positive um, wire from the power supply needs to come both here and here okay i've drawn um, uh, copper traces with red to symbolize the wires and the negative uh, wire okay from here basically you'll have to connect it to this point here and also to this point here okay uh, which is symbolized by this uh, red trace on which it says minus <clears throat> This is important because, again, I just couldn't root different um, things in a different way that would allow us to just come with these um, powers, this power supply voltage in just two points, and that's it. I needed four points. And on this board, we have the two inputs here on the left, uh, leftmost side of the board and the output here. Okay, of course you will need to connect wires and um, some adapt some some uh, some connectors. You know, um, what else is there to say? Yeah, and this has 35 millimeter um, width uh, and 100 um, length as well. Um, there are 100 millimeter um, wide boards, PCB boards. Uh, and th this is why I've chosen, uh, you know, this uh, this length. Um, also, we have here a separate, very small circuit that is um, this one that detects low battery voltage. I, I couldn't fit it anywhere, so I've put it separately. And for me, it's 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 uh, a good choice because. I have placed this very small circuit actually on the um, on the lid of the chassis, uh, whereas these two bigger boards obviously come into the box of the chassis, you know. And of course, you need to uh, connect two wires uh, from here um, all the way to um, well, all the way to your battery essentially. Okay, so the same uh, place where you connect these wires so yeah uh, this is pretty much it i will post uh, I, I will put the entire um an, an archive with uh, the entire collection of files that i've shown you uh, in order to build this uh, this project on patreon you can download it from there if you want to build it yourself I plan to use uh, all of this knowledge that I've accumulated in order to um, build um, something better in the future. Another um, differential um, uh, probe that goes to a lot more than just one megahertz and um, that is also relatively cheap and actually I have... Uh, I have some crazy ideas of building a box with multiple probes because you know we, we only we always have at least two channels on our oscilloscopes sometimes even four so uh, it doesn't really make that much sense to have one box for each differential probe in my mind it makes sense to have just a single box with multiple probes and a single power supply for all of them preferably a linear one and you know, since since these things can be really, really cheap, it makes sense to build multiple of them at the same time. Anyhow, that's it for today. I've had quite a lot of explanations to give, but as you can clearly understand, this is not exactly a trivial project. It's not a super complicated one either, but it's not trivial. So mm, there were plenty of things that needed to be explained. Thanks a lot for watching, um, 
please hit the like and subscribe button if you want to see more of my videos also um, if you like what i'm doing and you would like to support my work i have a patreon account you can find link in the description by helping me financially i can um, buy uh, components faster i can study things faster and i can come to you and show you what i've built so that you can build things yourself without having to spend so much time and energy learning all the things that i need to learn so thanks a lot for watching this and i'll see you in the next video bye bye mm -hmm.